In terms of character and personality, Pharaoh likewise forms an instructive type of Antichrist. His duplicity in dealing with Moses and Aaron is well known, and this is a characteristic of the beast's personality as well. Even more to the point in respect to his similarity to Antichrist is the exceptional hardness of heart he exhibited in the face of a series of awesome demonstrations of divine power at the hands of Moses and Aaron. Pharaoh's stubborn resistance to God was, in fact, only possible because of a special dispensation from God, which allowed him to harden his heart beyond normal human limits, Exodus 4.21. God's purpose in granting Pharaoh such extraordinary blindness was to demonstrate his own glory in the face of the most extreme resistance from the most powerful human being on earth at that time, Exodus 9.16. Antichrist too will boast against God and defy God to an extraordinary degree, Daniel 7, 8. And God will gain all the more glory through his complete victory over the beast at Christ's return. Finally, we also see many similarities in the destruction of Pharaoh and Antichrist. Both lead a pursuit against the Israelites in which they are intent upon their annihilation. Exodus 15, 9 with Daniel 11:44. Both are prevented from their objective by a unique darkness that precedes the critical engagement, Exodus 14.20 with Zechariah 14.6 and 7. In both cases, the Israelites are delivered through an extraordinary miracle, Exodus 14.21 through 25 with Zechariah 14.4 and 5. And the armies of both Pharaoh and Antichrist are subsequently trapped by God and totally destroyed along with their blasphemous commanders, Exodus 14.26 through 31, and Psalm 136.15. The King of Assyria, Isaiah chapters 7 through 39, and especially Isaiah 14, 24 through 27. Assyria was the Lord's rod, Isaiah 10, 5, with which he executed his terminal judgment upon the northern kingdom of Israel, and the waters rising up to the neck, with which he accomplished his severe warning judgment upon the southern kingdom of Judah, Isaiah 8, 6 through 8. It is in the Assyrian invasion of Judah that one sees a particularly close correspondence with Antichrist's later invasion. Indeed, as we saw in part one of this series, much of the first half of Isaiah is deliberately constructed with reference to the Day of the Lord paradigm. That is to say, Isaiah explains and expands his prediction of the Assyrian invasion by comparing it to Antichrist's later invasion. Assyria and her king are clear types of the beast, of his kingdom, and of his armed forces which invade the land of Israel and meet with equally miraculous disasters at the hands of God, Isaiah 37, 36, and 38, with Revelation 19, 19 through 21. In the process, both Sennacherib, through his minister Rabshakeh, Isaiah 36, 4 through 10, and the beast, Daniel 7, 8, speak unheard of things against the Lord, and it may well be that the threefold repetition in Scripture of the arrogant words of Sennacherib's representative is meant to emphasize the temerity of such hybristic conduct towards the Lord God. Indeed, this tendency not only to be arrogant in the extreme, but to express it verbally in extreme ways, was a notable characteristic of Assyria and of her king, and will be a salient feature of Antichrist and his regime as well, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Moreover, the statement in Nahum 1.11, From you, Nineveh, Assyria, one has come forth who conceives evil against the Lord, a counsellor of wickedness, is a prophetic one that also deliberately compares the contemporary king of Assyria with the coming Antichrist, a use of the so-called prophetic perfect tense in the Hebrew text. Assyria's attempt to utterly destroy Judah when the Lord's will was only that she be chastened, Isaiah 10.7, forms a direct parallel to Antichrist's future attempts to annihilate the Jewish state and the Jewish people, contrary to the expressed will of God, Ezekiel 38, 10 and 11. We can also see in the progress of the Assyrian Empire similarities with the Empire of the Beast, who likewise will conduct military campaigns against the southern powers, led by Egypt in both cases, and will similarly defeat his opposition in an unexpected and dramatic way. Isaiah chapter 19 is therefore prophetic, both in the near and in the far term, with the prophecy of verse 4 that the Lord will hand Egypt over to a cruel master and a fierce king, being both reminiscent of Assyrian rule 
and similar to the other prophecies about Antichrist's regime. Finally, the encouragement given to the citizens of Judah to persevere until the Lord removes the Assyrian threat is deliberately and perfectly appropriate for the Jewish believers who will be awaiting our Lord's advent, Isaiah 35, 3 and 4, when the Messiah returns to dispose of Antichrist and his armies in a manner similar to the destruction of the hordes of Sennacherib, Isaiah 37, 36 through 38, with Revelation 19, 19 through 21. The King of Babylon, Isaiah 14, 4 through 23. In Isaiah and elsewhere in Scripture, Babylon represents both a contemporary power and the future diabolical power, the home kingdom of the beast. The king of Babylon, moreover, is frequently acknowledged by interpreters to be a type of Satan, but what is less widely recognized is that this king is also a type of Antichrist. This double typology should not be difficult to accept when one recalls the significant similarities between the devil and his seed, Antichrist. For Satan and the beast represent the height of opposition to God in their respective species, angelic and human, and both lead rebellions against him and his universal order, in heaven and on earth, respectively. When we add to this the fact that Antichrist is literally the devil's own seed, Genesis 3.15, and will carry out Satan's will on earth, the appropriateness of the twofold typology here is immediately evident. Antichrist is the son of Satan and a deliberate counterfeit of the Son of God. It should not be surprising, therefore, that there are instances where prophetic typology applies equally to both, as it does on occasion for the Son of God and our Heavenly Father. See, for example, Isaiah 6, 1 through 13. The very relationship the devil is seeking to superficially mimic and exploit. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Antiochus Epiphanes. Daniel 8.23-26 Perhaps the most important and certainly the most detailed typology of Antichrist occurs in the book of Daniel, where we find the king of the Seleucid Empire, Antiochus Epiphanes, used extensively as a type for the beast. While we shall have much to say about these two chapters, it needs to be stressed here that the prophecies about Antiochus definitely do apply to Antichrist as well, so that we should see this typology operating in chapter 8 as well as chapter 11, and that typology beginning in chapter 11 with verse 21, and not withheld until verse 36, as is often wrongly supposed. In many respects, Antiochus is the perfect model for the future Antichrist, for his activities track those of the coming beast more closely than any of the other representatives listed previously. Antiochus and Antichrist both arise from unexpected and lowly beginnings. They are both individuals devoid of scruples or conscience. Both are successful military commanders. Compare Antiochus' alternate epithet, Nikephoros victorious with Daniel 11.37. Both come to rule kingdoms which dominate Israel from the north, the Syrian kingdom and Antichrist's ten-kingdom empire respectively, and the kingdoms of each are associated on the one hand with Babylon, Antiochus' capital of Seleucia was near Babylon, and Antichrist's home country and original power center is called Babylon, compare Revelation 18, and on the other, with Rome. Antiochus was educated at Rome, and copied much in the Roman social and political system, while Antichrist's ten-kingdom empire is, in great measure as we shall see, a revival of Rome. Both have names which express their implacable opposition to the Lord, the anti-prefix in Antiochus' name is identical to that of Antichrist, with his name as a whole meaning one who holds out against. Both are responsible for putting an end to the temple rites in Jerusalem, Daniel 8, 12 and 13, and both replace these rituals with rites which honor themselves, Daniel 11, 31, and which are in reality devil worship, Daniel 12, 11. Both represent themselves as divine. Compare Antiochus' epithet Epiphanes, meaning appearance that is a divine manifestation or epiphany, and coins which depict him as Zeus, with Daniel 11, 36 and 37. Both oppress the holy people of God to an extraordinary degree, resulting in significant apostasy and martyrdom, Daniel 11, 33 through 35. And both kings are highly radical in their methodology, choosing to remake society in every respect, 
after their own images and to fit their own purposes, regardless of the anti-God nature of their reforms, compare Antiochus's attempted Hellenization of the Jews with Antichrist's radical reforms, for example, Daniel 7.25. All of this perhaps explains how and why Daniel has so little trouble segueing directly from Antiochus as a type of Antichrist to a non-typological direct prophecy of the beast himself at verse 36 of Daniel chapter 11. The critical thing for the exegesis of this important prophetic chapter, however, is not to omit any of the information it provides about Antichrist, including that which comes our way as a result of the Antiochus Epiphanes typology, that is, in verses 21 through 35. 